Assalamu alaikum. Mr. Moderator, our distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, our friends and, and our enemies. All your energy and strength is used for attacking those who are actually trying to fight injustice. And you are non-existent, absent, not present, you know? Ghaib, you're ghaib, and as I see in Arabic, ghaib. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so how exactly has your Islam benefited you? If you have no issues with these pharaonic, Pharaoh, pharaonic uh, oppressors. You can't say nothing about them. You have nothing to say. You're just, you know. But you are. You have all this zeal and power to attack the oppressed peoples. So, and what do we have from this now? If you were around, if you were Muslim back in the in the nineties, we didn't have these these schisms. You know what I mean? Now we have all these imported schisms and, and sectarianism that has nothing to do with us. It doesn't pay our bills. It doesn't prevent our kids from growing up like gangsters. It doesn't uh, prevent our daughters from running off with whoever. Right? These schisms and all this sectarianism, that ain't got nothing to do with us. All of that was imported. All of it. If you're around in the 90s, you know this already. It's all new. Why do they do that? Think historically. Think historically about Christianity. Why were we put the, the, the call and the propagation of Christianity was the whipping post? Was it not? They will put our, our ancestors on the whipping posts and whip them until they accepted Christianity. That was the call. That was how they taught us Christianity. You feel me? So why is it now, when we didn't have these these schisms and the sectarianism, why is this important now for the black community? Why? You know, when a baby, when a baby cries, okay, there's this device that was built you know, there's manufacturers sometimes in, in maybe in the 60s or something or 70s, I don't know. But if a baby cries, a baby cries generally for just a, a couple of reasons. Why does a baby cry? A baby cries either because it's hungry, gassy, or, you know, is, is dirty pants or maybe tired, right? But the point of crying is a form of communication to the parents to know, for, for the parents to know that something is going on with that baby because that baby cannot speak. That baby doesn't have a voice. So that baby who doesn't have a voice is crying to communicate because that's the only form of communication that that baby has to let the, the parents know something's going on with it. You feel me? <clears throat> so, <clears throat> this technology of this small device of a pacifier is put inside the baby's mouth so that the baby stops crying and the parents don't have to hear no noise. Now, I want you to think about this now. The baby cries because... He or she is hungry or gassy. If you put a pacifier in the mouth of a baby, that baby stops crying, correct? 
But have you satisfied the hunger of that baby? Have you, you know, gotten rid of the colic and the gas in the, the belly of that baby with the pacifier? Or have you, by inserting the pacifier in the mouth of that baby, made the situation worse? Which one is it? Which one is it? And that, brothers and sisters, wa alaikum salam that, brothers and sisters, is the purpose and the goal of this pacifier to shut the baby up, but you made the situation worse. And these schisms and the sectarianism is meant to pacify you from the real issues that are going on in your community. What at the same time, making the situation in your communities worse. It's just a pacifier. It doesn't solve anything. Now with this white supremacist uh, power structure, this white supremacist power structure is working extra hard to control every aspect of your life. Media, you think media is just media, but it's not. Media is a weapon. U.S. officials have uncovered some five dozen incidents of alleged Soviet forgeries around the world. Some of the demonstrations are encouraged, even supported, by the Soviet Union. The State Department has copies of other documents allegedly forged by the KGB and fed to friendly publications. So what has changed? It's the platforms. Those stories appeared in magazines and newspapers, but now social media is the primary target. We use all means available to do damage to the enemy. The United States was the main adversary, the enemy. We hated you guys. Jack Braff, in those days, you know, it was pretty hard to disseminate uh, this kind of information. It took a lot of work, and you really have to focus on, on who do you want to do damage to with the resources that you have. Nowadays, it's so much easier. You know, social media makes it possible. But a new fault line has emerged in recent years. Social media. Cyber battles are now changing the age-old conflicts between the people in power and the power of the people. Most of us use these tools now. For some, they're weapons to start a revolution, to wage a war. The power of social media was mobilized in 2009 in Iran's failed Green Revolution, and then in the historic uprisings we call the Arab Spring. They started in Tunisia, went to Egypt, and across the region. It's not just activists who recognize this power. Governments, regimes use it too. In Syria, for example, the Syrian Electronic Army is described as the first virtual Arab army. It hacks into websites of the opposition, Western media, and human rights groups. In real wars, social media has become a weapon in every armory. I suggest you all read The Art of War. You know, Sun Zhu, in The Art of War, he writes, if you can uh, basically conquer your enemy without firing a shot, this is the best tactic. And the Russians, the communist Russians, they perfected this tactic called subversion. What's subversion? Subversion is essentially using media. You don't spy on your enemies. What you, you don't try to extract their ideas. What you try to do is you try to insert ideas onto the populace. How do you do that? Through the music, through the news, through the entertainment, through your the social media now, right? The social media is the new weapon. It is the new weapon. Subversion can be only successful when the initiator, the actor, the, act, the agent of subversion has a responsive target. It's a two-way traffic. United States is a receptive target of subversion. There is no response similar to that one from United States to the Soviet Union. It stops halfway somewhere. It never reaches here. 
The theory of subversion goes all the way back 2,500 years ago. The first human being who formulated the tactics of subversion was a Chinese philosopher by the name of Sun Tzu. to 2,500 years B.C. He was an advisor for several imperial courts in, in ancient China. And he said, after long meditation, that to implement, foreign, uh, to implement state policy in a warlike manner, it's the most counterproductive, barbaric, and inefficient to fight on a battlefield. You know that war is continuation of state policy, right? So if you want successfully to implement your state policy, and you start fighting, this is the most idiotic way to do it. The highest art of warfare is not to fight at all, but to subvert anything of value in the country of your enemy until such time that the perception of reality of your enemy is screwed up to such an extent that he does not perceive you as an enemy and that your system, your civilization and your ambitions look to your enemy as an alternative, if not desirable, then at least feasible. Better red than dead. That's the ultimate purpose the final stage of subversion, after which you can simply take your enemy without a single shot being fired if the subversion is successful. This is basically what subversion is. As you see, not a single mentioning of blowing up bridges. Of course, Sun Tzu didn't know about blowing up bridges. Maybe there were not that many bridges at that time. <laughs> but the basics of subversion is being taught to every student of KGB school in USSR and to officers of, of military academies. I'm not sure if the same author is included in the list of reading for American officers, to say nothing about ordinary students of political science. I had difficulty to find the translation of Sun Tzu in, in the library of of a university in Toronto and later on here in, in Los Angeles. But it's a, it's a book which is not available. It is forced to every student in USSR. Every student who is, who is taught to be dealing further in, in, in his future career with foreigners. What subversion is? Basically, it consists of four periods, time-wise. If we start from here, and go this way, time, right? This is the beginning point. The first stage of subversion is the process which is called, basically, demoralization. It says for itself what it is. It takes from, uh, say, 15 to 20 years to demoralize a society. Why? by 15 or 20 years. This is the time sufficient to educate one generation of students or children. One generation. One lifetime span of a person, a human being, which is dedicated to study, to shaping up the outlook, ideology, personality. No more, no less. Usually it takes from 15 to 20 years. What it includes? It includes influencing or by various methods, infiltration, uh, propaganda methods, direct contacts, doesn't really matter. I will describe them later. <laughs> of various areas where public opinion is formulated or shaped, religion, educational system, social life, administration, law enforcement system, military, of course, and labor and employer relations.